Let's look at some of the basic concepts of static timing analysis. The main objectives of this module are identifying where does static timing analysis fits into your flow. Also, identify timing library information for timing arcs such as unateness, cell delays, net delays, and SLU. When you design a circuit, you need to make sure that it's working correctly. There are multiple ways of doing that. You can run a functional simulation, but that is only checking to see if your circuit will actually function correctly. You can run a spice analysis, but that takes too long for each path because you have to time millions of paths. So in static timing analysis, we look at the circuit devoid of any time frames. And so simply just add the cell delays and the net delays from the libraries or elsewhere, come up with the path delays, and then compare these path delays to a timing specification as given by your constraints. Synthesis tools convert your RTL to gates. Place and route further optimizes your design. For these optimization tools to find the right cells for the right location, they rely on static timing analysis to calculate the path delays. Static timing analysis has to time millions of paths every hour to give the correct and accurate information to these optimization tools so that they can create a circuit that meets your timing requirements. Finally, the same static timing analysis is also used to analyze the timing of the circuit to make sure it works at the required frequency. This is done using more stringent requirements, such as those for sign-off. Each of these tools, which are considered sign-off tools, have different flavors or ways of doing their timing sign-off with different capabilities. This is a typical flow for your design. First, we specify circuit functionality and timing libraries. You'll then capture your RTL and write constraints. If we provide all this input to the synthesis tool, it will then convert this RTL to gates using the libraries. While doing that, the synthesis tool will try to meet the timing constraints. This is the first time after we use the synthesis tool, which is using STA internally to figure out what cells to use. Then, later on, at the end of synthesis, we will run static timing analysis to verify the timing of the synthesis results. When we are satisfied with that, we push it to place and route, where we again use static timing analysis to place the cells and route the design in such a way that it meets the timing requirements. The STA is used for this purpose to meet timing. Finally, we run the final verification using sign-off tools to verify your design, if it meets your timing requirements, and then once we're satisfied, we push the design to layout. The timing engines that are built-in synthesis and place and root software provide a fast way of selecting cells so that the synthesis and place and root software can optimize the paths for better timing. They all have this function of providing the timing information to these tools. You also have the timing verification tools which provide the final sign-off after the design is synthesized or placed and routed. These timing verification tools typically sign off on all the different timing checks and constraints, whether the design is meeting the specifications or not. The timing tools or timing engines in synthesis and place and route often try to calibrate themselves to make sure that they correlate well with the timing verification tools. Timing libraries provide delays of cells, interconnects, also known as nets and wires. Apart from this, they also provide power and skew information. The STA tool uses this information to calculate the path delays and then verify these path delays against the constraint requirements that are provided. The standard format that is widely used in the industry is the Liberty format, also known as LIB. There are other formats like ECSM or LBR that are used by different tools internally. Most tools accept the Liberty format or lib as an input. As we've seen before, the STA tool is calculating the timing path delays. These timing paths mainly consist of two basic elements. One is the timing arc in the cells and the timing arcs of the nets. The goal in timing is to restrict the path delay to a certain amount as specified by the constraints. In this example, we have a flop that provides timing check data. So, the checks are also part of static timing analysis. What are timing arcs? If a change on the input is causing a change in the output, then we have a causal relationship. If the input in this inverter is rising and the output is falling, or when the input is falling, the output is rising. This dependency of the output on these inputs is called a causal relationship. Each of these imaginary arcs between the input and the output is called a timing arc. It's important to understand timing arcs so that you can determine the path delays correctly because not every arc is symmetric. The rising to falling arc is probably not the same as falling to rising arc. 
We need to determine each arc based on how the output is actually behaving based on the inputs. All of this information is provided in the timing library, specifically, how to understand the purpose of each of these timing arcs. The following are the different characteristics of a timing arc, unateness, slew, and delay. Specific information for a timing arc can be obtained from the timing libraries. Let's look at what each of these means and what is their purpose. Unateness is a very important property of all timing arcs. Static timing analysis uses unateness extensively to determine how the timing information is calculated. If you look at the example of a buffer, the output is rising when the input is rising, the output is falling, when the input is falling. So, the timing arc is a positive unate because the transition of the output is the same as the transition on the input. If you look at the inverter, when the input is rising, the output is falling. And when the input is falling, the output is rising. So, the transition is the opposite of the input transition. Therefore, this is considered as negative unate. Some arcs, of course, can be non-unate where there is no relationship between how the output is changing against the input. But most of the time, you can easily determine the unateness of a timing arc by looking at the truth table of that particular cell. So, for a buffer, you can actually say it's going from 0 to 1, and the output is changing from 0 to 1 at the same time. So that gives you clues into how to determine the unateness of each individual timing arc in certain cells that are multiple inputs. We have to look at each timing arc to determine what the unateness of that particular timing arc is. So for every input to output relationship, that is one arc. Every input output combination forms a timing arc. Here you can see the different arcs of a NAND cell and their corresponding library timing sense attributes. The timing sense of a NAND gate for the IN pin is shown as positive UNATE and the B pin is shown as negative UNATE. Each related pin under the timing section of the output pin represents a timing arc. UNATENESS of the timing arc is specified in the library by the timing sense attribute. When the NET B is rising, NET Y is falling. Therefore, the timing arc is negative UNATE. When NET A is raising, NET Y is rising. Therefore, the timing arc is positive unate. Try the following activities to reinforce your learning. All semiconductor devices take some time to switch between states. Transition time is the time that a signal takes to change states from low to high or high to low. The picture shows signal rising from low to high and signal falling from high to low. These rise and fall transition times are the properties of a timing arc. Usually, rise time and fall time are measured between 10 and 90% or 20 and 80% of your input signal or your output signal and calculated as rise times or fall times. Technically, the rate of transition is measured in volts per nanosecond and is called SLU. Transition times such as the rise and fall times are measured in terms of time, typically in nanoseconds. STA tools measure input and output transition time using SLU thresholds. These SLU thresholds are defined in the library, and the input rise and fall times are calculated from the SLU thresholds. The transition time is the time it takes for a signal to rise or fall. The upper threshold value determines the actual time at which a device turns on and stays on. The lower threshold value determines the time at which the device turns off and stays off. In the illustration, the lower thresholds are 20%, and the upper thresholds are 80%. The rise transition is measured from 20% to 80% of the signal, and the fall transition is measured from 80% to 20%. SLUs are typically measured in a small voltage percentage range, like 40 to 60, to capture a more linear portion of of the transition. These measured slews are then scaled to the library slew thresholds.
From the library, we have an example here where slew is measured as 0.05 at the 40 to 60 range. So, it's a 20% swing. And the library slew thresholds are 10 to 90, which is an 80% swing. So, this rate of transition or slew is recorded as 0.05 times 80 over 20, which is 0.20. Timing libraries capture everything in the form of table lookup, also known as lookup tables or LUTs. In this example, it is a representation of what's in the library in the form of a table and is more easily readable. If you want to identify what the output transition is, just picture the table plotted as index 1 and index 2, where input slew is index 1, and load is index 2. You look up the output transition value as for that corresponding slew and corresponding load. This example shows the output transition is plotted between the input transition and the output load. Based on the example for an input transition of 0.05, the value of the output load is 0.021. Based on the lookup table, the value is shown to be 0.293559. In these lookup tables, remember that index 1 is always the row and index 2 is always the column. This way you can always identify what the values are based on what is specified for index 1 and then index 2. The delays of the next stage input transition or slew depend on the input transition or slew of the previous stage. Thus, we calculate the output transition or the next stage input transition or slew values using these lookup tables. To reiterate, the STA tools calculate the output transition times and use that value as the input transition to the next cell in the same path or next stage. This is how we propagate the delays in cells and find out the delays throughout the path from these lookup tables from one stage to the next and so on. Because the input signal is constant, and the signal is actually traveling across many stages along the path, the slew at the output of one stage degrades before it gets to the next stage and so on and so forth. As it travels along a long net, you'll see slew degradation happen. So as this slew degrades, the signal actually degrades as well. The delays get longer and longer based on the slews degrading. So, we need to capture all these slew degradations as we go along. There is a lookup table for slew degradation as well, which uses the output pin transition and the interconnect delay or the net delay and calculates the degradation. You will see these degradation tables in your timing libraries. These kinds of calculations give you the overall timing through that path, and how bad it will degrade based on these slew degradation tables. Try the following activities to reinforce your learning. Depending on the process technology, different physical elements have different levels of contribution. Delays encountered in digital circuitry are composed of two main components cell delay and net delay. Each stage delay, whether it's cell delay or net delay, represents the time required to propagate a signal from the input of one stage to the input of the next. Historically, with process technologies above 90 nanometers, cell delay has been the major limiting factor in timing closure. However, at process technologies below 90 nanometers, net delays dominate the cell delays.